Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's really nice to see you guys in here because it's 85 degrees, and I know I'd like to be out having a cold beer. But um, in any event, I, I really appreciate you guys coming in. We've heard so many cool things at this conference about such high-level strategy about marketing and IMC in the last couple days, and so I appreciate you guys coming in to really dig deep with me tactically on video and why video could be more than a tactic but a full-blown integrated strategy that should be part of your um, marketing mix all the way around. So my name is Joe Gora. I am the Senior Communications Manager for Digital Assets as part of the Microsoft Trustworthy Computing Group. Uh, we're a company that loves our long titles and crazy department names, and I'll explain what all of it means as we go along. Um, the Trustworthy Computing Group is the part of Microsoft that handles security, privacy, reliability, online safety, and accessibility communications. And it covers every single product we put out, which is to say almost every single one of you in this room is using at least one of the products we touch in our comms every day. And unlike typical product marketers, we don't have a skew. We don't have a tangible thing. We can't move an Xbox to you. We're trying to move the idea of security as what Microsoft's philosophy is on it. So you can imagine how difficult it is to sort of tell some of those stories, but I'll show you how we use video to sort of help make that a lot easier. Um, what you're looking at here is the Trustworthy Computing Communications Studio. It is about the size of where I'm standing to about the size of that desk over there. There's a set on this one end, it's got two teleprompters, three cameras, this green screen, this little curved wall here, and some lights, and then behind that, if we were over in the other end of the studio now, like I am, this is where our, there'd be a desk and some, and some broadcast equipment, a couple of fancy monitors, a switcher, um, audio board, a lot of the basic stuff that you'd find in you know, a lot of places. And this place was a broom closet four years ago. I mean, you must think we have a lot of brooms, but it, it really was just a closet. So we ended up just developing this, and this came along a little bit before my time at the, at the Trustworthy Computing Group, but people were saying, there's got to be an easier way to do video, and we just can't figure it out. And so when I joined the team, I eventually got pulled into that. And so I'll walk you through a little bit of my background now. I was a TV person, and always will be, apparently, and that's totally fine. Um, I was a sports person when I was a kid, and way back in the day, I was a bit of a stat statistics geek. I had every baseball card, I read every stat, I knew what every guy was doing, and I could still tell you the 1989 Oakland Athletics starting lineup. No takers. Okay, so in, in any event, well, we end I ended up getting a job at Fox Sports Northwest in Pullman, Washington, a place so remote it makes Morgantown look like Manhattan, and I ended up taking a job at Fox Sports Northwest at the age of 18. And in the interest of full disclosure, I lied about my age. They named off every single thing you had to be to have this job as a producer. And they said you had to know sports, be organized, passionate about statistics and telling stories with it. And then they said you had to be at least 20, and at least a junior at the university. And I thought to myself, that's the dumbest reason to ever walk away from an opportunity. And so I walked into it. And so I went on in television and still finished my undergrad full time and ended up going back to San Francisco where I grew up and I worked at CBS and at ABC uh, for you know, quite a few years um, while I finished up. I was also in charge of elections, no shortage of data in those things. Um, and, and it really, really helped me embrace, and this isn't just me doing the biographical bit for my own glory, this really helped me build a foundation for understanding process in communication extremely well. Elections are about, are, are about getting it right and getting it first, sure, but they're also about getting the process. The process helps you get it first and get it right, and that helped me down the line. Um, towards the end of my TV time, I wanted to move out of San Francisco, and I moved up to, back to Seattle and ended up uh, getting a job as director of digital media at the CW station in Seattle, which is owned by CBS. And over at CBS, and in broadcasting in general, Joe Barnes could tell you the same thing, he and I were chatting beforehand. You know, they, they seem to, the, the, the mindset seems to be, as long as the TV station is still selling enough 30-second spots to Mattress World, we're doing okay. I saw digital for what it was. It's an opportunity. When we grew sales and social and followers on MySpace in those days, by so much I was like, this is really going somewhere, and I want to be part of it where it's bigger. So I joined this little company in Redmond, just across the lake, you might have heard of them, and I took 
just to get my foot in the door, a job in the internal communications for the general counsel of Microsoft, a guy named Brad Smith. And in doing internal comms for him, I thought, okay, well, I'll get to learn about the law, and I always kind of like John Grisham books, so this shouldn't be so bad. And in that time, I, it wasn't that long before Brad came to me and said, you did TV. And I said, yeah. And he said, we need to be able to talk to our thousand lawyers in 40 countries. And here's a thousand bucks. Can I get a camera or something? And so I bought a camera and a very modest light kit for about a thousand dollars. And that's what we did. And we made video after video of Brad talking and keeping everybody you know, on the same page, which in a company as sprawling and <laughs> omnipresent as Microsoft is, you can imagine that has its challenges and we were able to do a lot of good things. Time went by, I got tired of doing internal comms. You know, I wanted to kind of do more external stuff and do the, you know, do this sort of thing and see folks like you. So I ended up moving on. And I joined the Trustworthy Computing Group to go work in a very low stress job called Crisis Response. <laughs> um, <laughs> And you learn a lot about process there too, because responding to a crisis is all about doing the right thing at the right time and not wasting time. Um, and the crisis response team also had, was my boss at the time, had this little studio that he was afraid to do anything with. And that's the picture you saw a moment ago. And so after a little while there, they came to me and said, you know, Joe, you might not be the best press statement writer, but we know you're pretty good at this video thing and we'd like you to figure this out. So you look at this TV stuff and you look at this Microsoft stuff and just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. So here I am. And then I'd be remiss to mention, if I didn't mention, that I am, of course, a student in the IMC program. I started a year ago, and I'm six courses in. Um, and fun fact, I wanted to go here, actually, to Morgantown, to West Virginia, in some time called the 90s, as an undergrad. And my SAT scores were sent here. So 20 years later, <laughs> here we are. Go Mountaineers. So thank you for sort of indulging me through that. I know that the fifth session of the day that you've been sitting down for, you really wanted to hear a guy's life story. Um, I'm here to tell you to talk to you about the importance of digital video. This will give us a good foundation for, because eventually you do have to ask for money, even if it's $1,000 for a camera and lights. And here's why it's important. Digital video is no longer just something we sort of do. We don't take our 30 second spot and just throw it online and put it on our website and call it a day. Um, this piece from this MetLife ad, you might think I picked it because MetLife has this awesome strategy and they're great, and I'm sure they are, but the point is, the day I was building this slide, this is what was on the TV screen at the gym while I was working out. And when I saw it, it struck me. Two years ago, you'd see a Facebook logo, YouTube, you know, Facebook logo, and the Twitter bird, and all these other things. Instead, at the end of this spot, you see youtube.com slash MetLife. And if you go to MetLife's site, just like if you go to Old Spice's YouTube page as well, which we talked about in one of the IMC courses, you'll find that the narrative completely continues. The digital story and the video story completely continues, and it's all very engrossing. And I should also say I like MetLife because I like Snoopy a lot. So. so there is a place for it, and it's only getting bigger. 86% of brands increased their video spend in 2014 as compared to 2013. 61% of younger executives now say that they, rely more on, they, will, they will rely more on video in the next five to 10 years. But five to 10 years is a little way off. Let's talk about three years from now. By 2017, 70% of the consumer internet traffic will be video. We all got things to put out there. We've all got people to, brands we need to market. How are you gonna be part of that 70%? It's time to think about integrating video a little more. And some of the stuff I've learned here in the IMC program has been very, very helpful. Um, this was part of IMC 616. Anybody recognize this? Yeah, Natalie and I know. It's the direct marketing, every year they do the, the Direct Marketing Association Statistical Fact Book. They've had tons of these, and I just said I love data, which meant I loved reading 213 pages of this for school. But I especially loved what I saw on page, seven, on page 19. And for those of you in the back, I'll just summarize. This is a survey of marketers, content with the best return on investment, according to marketing professionals. Featured articles, 62% in first place. In second and fourth is video and photos at 52% and 38%. That's beating things like white papers, sales copy, infographics, and buyer's guides. Think about that for a minute. How much time do you spend working on sales copy? How much time do you spend working on white papers? 
I know in my group, we spend a lot of time working on blog posts, and we spend a lot of time working on a lot of these other things. But we don't really spend a lot of time thinking about video, mainly because my team just goes, Joe, figure it out. But not every team has a me. So beyond this, though, why else is it important? It's not just because it's shiny. It's because it gets results and keeps people stimulated. This takes me back to something I learned in 612, which I had Professor Quisenberry for, which may I take a moment to apologize for missing his session if he's in the room. <laughs> so, um, this was a part of a study from the Stockholm School of Economics, which, you know, I don't know how many of you are also on their mailing list, but I got these guys uh, through the Journal of um, Advertising, which came out in October of last year when I was researching something for 612. There was a study where they determined, they, wanted, they hypothesized that if you have a really creative ad, like this nice lady in her um, martini glass here, that if you had a really creative advertisement next to some editorial written content, they thought if you had that kind of ad, as opposed to a more boring ad, next to it, it, it would make readers more drawn in and more stimulated and more creative. They had them draw pictures afterwards, after reading the boring thing and then reading the not boring thing, and they made some conclusions based on that. Their hypotheses were perfectly correct. They were proven right. When people saw this, they drew better pictures. They made better stuff, and better yet, they comprehended what was in that editorial content better. Okay, so what have we been talking about at this conference? You know, we've talked about own, own content so much here in these last couple days. And one of the things I, you know, think about is we all have web pages out there in the world if you're running on a, if you have a brand. I know here, I know Microsoft, we love the internet a lot. We have lots of data and lots of stuff and lots of pages. But do they have content that keeps the viewer engaged? Are they web pages and digital content for web pages and digital content's sake? I think if we're trying to win hearts and minds, we need to stimulate our readers, much like the folks in Stockholm found out. So to me, it's clear we have a need. But the question then becomes, how do we feed the beast? There are a lot of screens to fill up there. The studio I have produces 80, between 80 and 100 videos a year. We push out one every three days three to four days. We do them at remarkable amounts of speed and turnaround, as I'll get into in a little bit. So there's my model, but what's the first thing someone thinks of when they think, I gotta make video? They think we gotta hire out. Oh my God, this is too much, I can't do it. I can't do it, I'm not creative, I'm not this, I'm not that. So we gotta hire out. We gotta hire a director, a producer, a craft services table, uh, the camera guy, a steady cam, all these other things. We gotta hire out like a lot, and it's gonna cost a ton of money. And then I have to run it past my client, and then I have to get more money from this guy, and then the lawyers need to weigh in to make sure that nobody said the wrong thing during the shoot. This is problematic. So it's a cast of thousands to make your video, and you're wondering, is it really necessary? Am I gonna get the ROI that I saw in that Direct Marketing Association book a little while ago? And there's, there's a big misconception out there is to look good, we have to spend a lot of money. But let me remind you, the people perpetuating this myth, this nice gentleman in the beret, is the same person who's trying to run a business. He's selling you these people because he knows he has to, because he knows he can, and because he knows he'll meet little resistance. I did a shoot out in New York, you'll see a picture from it in a little bit, and I just needed a camera guy for half a day. And it was just a typical business trip where, you know, I was running a little behind, and I'm trying to negotiate with him, and I get on the plane, to go to, from Seattle to Newark, New Jersey. It's a five hour flight. And I say, here's what I need. I need a shooter for half a day. He needs to meet me in Queens tomorrow at 11. I get on the plane 20 minutes later, and, and at, right, right when they let us know we can use our email, they say, yeah, it'll be $4,500. And I said, for half a day? I know New York is spendy, but come on. Yeah, they say, oh, no, 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 we're sending you a grip and an audio person and an assist and, of course, the camera guy, and he's got this thing and that thing. And I go, and because I spoke the language, I said, no, I need a shooter. Just him, half a day. He gives me the footage at the end. And they went, okay, how about 3,000 an hour later? Then I pretended to not be on mail for three hours. <laughs> then I landed in Newark, and my phone had blown up, and I said, and suddenly they were magically down to 2,000. Okay, workable. I'm calling it the last minute. I should pay a little more. Not a big deal. So we did that. But the point is, this is how the business works. It's just how it is sometimes. And I don't blame these folks. They're just trying to run a business. 
But when you're trying to produce enough content to fill a YouTube channel, this is something scale-wise can get out of hand in a hurry. So what I'd like to show you now is the sort of work that my team does on one day of work with my staff of one and a half. And I think that might sound really good, but then you think the staff of one and a half also includes me. The half is the guy who works part-time for me as my cameraman and editor. So through the magic of projector fun, let's show you a little piece we did for our accessibility team. My name is Tyler Strink. I live in Buffalo, Washington, and I have a spinal cord injury. So I'm going to go through my morning routine, just the usual applications I use when I first get on my tablet in the morning. Start listening. The Surface helps me with doing a variety of things, such as checking my email to reading the newspaper, scroll up, scroll up. Also, communicating with people through Skype, call. Hi, Jose, how's your day going? These technologies are important for me. The Xbox One and Surface helps me do research, collaborate, and get work done. Using this technology makes me feel empowered, being able to do many of the day-to-day -day tasks that I was able to do before I got there. So Tyler, uh, Bothell, Washington, by the way, is down the road from us. We drove two exits up the freeway. And and uh, met with Tyler and we were in his home for about an hour. It was myself and another person. We shot him doing what he does and interacting with who he interacts with and really just part of being part of his life for just an hour. He did this thing for half an hour. I talked to him for maybe 15 minutes. That's it. That was published on May 5th. It has over 20,000 views on YouTube and hasn't been promoted anywhere. Um, that is 20,000 more people that likely now have a slightly better opinion about how Microsoft products like Xbox, Surface, Windows, Internet Explorer, I'm sure I missed one in there that someone would get back at me for when they see this on tape, but all those products help him. And by the way, the best part of that story, which frankly, if I'd done a better job, I would have been clearer about, that was all off the shelf. He didn't buy anything or download anything that isn't on the same Surface or machine that you have, that you can buy yourself at Best Buy or Walmart. That tells, that, that tells a powerful story to us, and given that that was one day of work, not a bad day. But I still can't convince you. Let's say you still want to spend money, and you still think you have to, and you're just like the guy that ran Jurassic Park. Oh, but you know what, hang on. Before I get to the Jurassic Park guy, let's consider these myths busted, and why is the clicker not going? My bad. I want Beret guy to like change here. I'm getting tired of Beret guy. All right, so let's consider the cast of thousands, and the look, to look good, we have to spend a lot of money myths debunked. Let's just throw them out. But if I can't convince you, and you're just like the guy who ran Jurassic Park, and I forget the name of the character, but I know the actor is Richard Attenborough, I loved in that movie how he constantly said, we spare no expense. Of course, the park ended up being destroyed by the dinosaurs. Good point to remember. But let's say you, you still have the money to have Spielberg direct your shoots, and Matthew Weiner write your scripts, and George Lucas do your special effects. That's terrific. Let me, let me attack this from another point of view. If you're really dropping that much money on that much video, how well are you feeding that beast? How well are you putting up those, those YouTube videos and continuing that conversation that brands like MetLife and Old Spice are? If you're MetLife's competitor, can you really keep up with them and keep that narrative moving? Maybe. I know you'll spend a lot of money, and if you have a budget of that size, I have one question for you. Can I have a job, please? Let's look at it from another side as well. Let's be consumer-centric. I've heard that so much up in, this, up in this area this weekend. I was going to say stage, but I just realized I wasn't elevated. Let's hear about, let's, let's think about your customers. But let's talk about corporate structure first. You have four marketing teams, product marketing teams. You tell them, I want you guys to go out and make the best video content that supports what you're doing, that we're trying to do here as a company. The free markets at work, all four of them hire four different guys. But you had budget, so who cares? Those four different video companies end up making four different videos. And they kind of look like what aligns to your brand. And they're still about your company, but they're just a little different. Maybe not all the right stuff hits, because well, four different people made something. And then you go to publish, and well, everybody wants to be special and have their page about this, and their page about that, and their page about the other. And before you know it, 
my question to you is, how is your customer supposed to get a holistic view of what your company is when your videos are sitting on four different YouTube channels in four different places? It happens more than you think. So now that it's spread around this much, and now that everything's everywhere, I think I can convince you it's time to integrate video a little more closely to keep it from running away. So it's time to integrate, and I want to walk you through a little bit more about exactly how we did it. Of course, everyone's mileage may vary. Let's go back to our product marketing teams. And instead of having them look outwards, they look in. There's one person in the middle of it, me. And what you do is every video goes through my studio. And even if it doesn't, I still have a seat at the table and I tell whoever we hire out in the rare case we need to. That, and sometimes, by the way, there is a need for the hiring out. The Steve Gleason Super Bowl ad we ran is a perfect example of that. But at the same time, I have a seat at the table and I make sure, hey, this is the right logo, this is what we're trying to do these days. And the, the reason I'm able to do that is because I work in those same hallways and I talk to those same people and I sit at those same places. And also, in being fully integrated, we have the awesome part of not just producing the piece, but publishing the piece. And it can all sit on one channel. So we integrated and built a trustworthy computing channel that sits under me, so, we, so I create and publish under, under our operation. And I know what's important to promote because I know what the general manager's thinking because I see her all the time. And I know what our business objectives are. It's not farmed out. One of the things about our YouTube channel and the things we learn about it and the things I love about doing digital as opposed to broadcast where I used to work is that we know what's really going on with our viewers and our stats and, and you know, um, our speaker at 11 today, it was Ellen Valentine I believe, you know, really showed that off well with some of the data and some of the responses we get. And it, this applies to video just as well. In broadcasting, when I did the morning news and we thought we had good ratings, we didn't know if you were off brushing your teeth in the bathroom and just left the TV on. But here we know. We have a little figure I like to call the consumption rate. And the consumption rate, YouTube, by the way, calls it the average view duration, which I think is just a little too googly. I think consumption rate's a little cleaner. But it's basically how long a viewer sticks with an average video. And from this information and this analysis, we're able to glean, you know, and your mileage may vary, but we're able to glean that people stick with our videos for about two and a half minutes. And this is important because so many people come to me in thinking that we're just taskmasters and not really creators. I'm sure, I, I'm sure some of our marketing friends don't have that have problem with their clients, but they'll come and they'll demand and they'll say, I need 11 minutes to talk about this security feature I wrote that does this and this in the kernel of Windows. And I'll say, you really think so? <coughs> and then they'll demand 11 minutes and then they'll cut to nine. The first thing they'll say is they, then they need a nine minute video. Then I call up a stat like this. The Tyler piece, by the way, which you just watched, people stick with it 87% of the way through. I will show that 11 minute video and show a past project. And sometimes I do let them through just, you know, sometimes they do have important data. But I show them that, that 11 minute video and the views crash at about three minutes in on a good time. And I say, you can write 11 minutes, but you better put anything important in the first three because no one cares about the rest. And the guy will fight with me and fight with me because sometimes, you know, tech people can be a little insistent. And I just say, you're not negotiating with me. You're negotiating with the audience. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I do. It matters what these people do. After a few sober conversations, we do get the time of video much lower and the consumption rate much higher. But video, like I was just getting in, like I was just saying a little while ago, it isn't all about, you know, just having a system and just having, just shooting and editing and la 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 and having fun and a little bit of jet setting here and there and knowing where the good restaurants are in Chelsea in New York City. It's about process and putting it together cleanly and still letting everybody have a personality. And this is sort of a smorgasbord of all the things we've created. And so when I looked at our business and I really just, I, I just looked very hard and asked the hard questions. Are we doing the right thing by our customers? Are we telling a holistic story? What is our story? You know, because the general manager of our comms group certainly has an idea, and the director, and the VP, and all the way up to Satya Nadella, the CEO, has an idea of what our story should be. Are we actually communicating it? So we scale to the needs of our business. And I can't solve everything in a 1,000 square foot studio, but I can certainly solve a few things. And one of the pluses of having that 
really good broom closet, is that we can shoot on site really fast. Um, the biggest thing we do, or the most sometimes the most impactful thing we do in our business, is we respond to security incidents. If there's suddenly some big security problem with a product, we're the people that help set it straight, help get the message out there, and help people understand what they may have to do to stay protected. Put another way, when your Windows PC tells you to reboot because important updates are need to be installed, please let it reboot. Don't let it wait. But my friend Dustin Childs up here is the guy who's the voice of it, and I do a lot of his writing, and frankly, he and I work together so long, I can, you know, we complete each other's sentences at this point. But this piece that we do with Dustin with the security bulletins about, hey, here's what's going on in Windows and Internet Explorer and all these things, can now be produced in three hours start to finish. We can be taping at one and be on the air at four. It was simple. We just went to the, I just went to the lawyers and said, listen, what is your main problem you're looking for when you need to approve something? Oh, we just want to make sure you're not doing A, B, C, D, and E. Fine. Done. I'll stay off of those, I'll stay off of those things and I won't use those words. Cool. Geopolitical, what's your problem if I do this and this? As long as you don't do A, B, and C, you're cool. Nobody ever bothered to ask those people who insisted on a seat at the table to approve content. If you get ahead of it, you can make things easier for yourself. And by the way, these pieces can pull within the hundreds of thousands of views when things are crazy. But it's more, you know, the common theme that I love that I heard so much of this weekend is about humanizing and telling the human story of what really happens and in, in product marketing and in any kind of marketing. You know, I think of the pens yesterday that Jenny Dietrich was talking about. I think of a lot of the stuff Lee brought up this morning. And when I look at it, we had the same exact problem. We weren't humanizing things. I meet a lot of interesting people. And, and you have a portfolio that includes security and accessibility and online safety. You meet parent advocates. You meet politicians. You meet security experts who worked at the CIA and all these other places. You just meet people. I meet people who are hackers who don't tell me their real name, but instead, like Pam Dinner, they say, hi, I'm at so-and-so. And it's usually not their first and last name. They don't really like to tell me. But they're eclectic. They're interesting. And we weren't capturing that, and we weren't putting that out there. So one of the first things I did when they gave me video full time <coughs> is we had a contest called the Blue Hat Prize. And this was in the summer of 2012. And we were basically giving three independent security researchers a chance to say, here's how I would fix a major security problem or a major, I don't say a problem, an issue with a, with a product. They said, here, and they would submit it, and we picked three winners, and we flew them to Las Vegas for the big Black Hat security conference, and then what do we do? Well, that was the debate of the marketing team, right? We were like, well, how, do we, how do we make this sing? How do we get some coverage? How do we make this work? And in those meetings, it was things like, well, we could, you know, why don't we announce it at the booth at the trade show with 200 other booths? Okay. Why don't we put out a press release and give an exclusive to a reporter? Well, that's fine, too. And then I piped up with my crazy ideas. And I said, you know, we're having this party Thursday night. And it's at the hippest nightclub in the Cosmopolitan Hotel. And, well, we've already sunk the money into the party, so it's no new money. Why don't we just ten minute, take, take 10 minutes of the party and just do a little, have a little fun? And so we decided to do an American Idol style reveal that I wrote. And I had two cameras, one of them unmanned. Yes, I left a camera unmanned in a nightclub. Um, <laughs> and I lived to tell the story. Um, and then uh, we did the piece. And the fun, by the way, the fun part about my job is, I can sometimes walk up to a guy who runs the big strobe light machine in the, in, the, in the nightclub and go, so when he says the name of the winner, this gentleman, Vasilis Pappas, I want you to hit every button on your console. He goes, I think I'll short it out. I said, I think I'd like to see that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we did. And so Vasilis here, very, very nice guy. He was from Greece, came all the way out, and he won $200,000. Big story in and of itself. But here's what I paid attention to. I didn't care that our video might have been followed or not. I cared that there were two dozen reporters pushing their way to the front of the dance floor, holding their cameras like this, and then posting it on their article a little while later. Remember what we were talking about earlier about help reporters? Well, that was a good way to do it. Now, my version of the video came out a little while later at about 1 a.m. Pacific time. 
um, by the way, when the session was over, when this fun part happened, uh, we tore down the cameras and ran two blocks like maniacs down to Caesars, where we were staying, and in 100 degree heat, and almost killed a bunch of tourists with our tripods, and edited the video, <laughs> and published it that night. And so this gentleman and I, Vasilis, were sitting um, up on the deck at Caesars Palace at the after party, and yes, I let him pay for drinks, he was 200,000 richer. And um, there was about eight of them, eight of his friends, watching on their mobile device what we just posted. His reaction to winning that. So mobile works, quick turnarounds work, good planning works. Furthermore, in humanizing technology, the, you know, the other issue we work with with senior citizens, I was talking about the New York trip a while ago. What you see on the top of that photo was New York. These senior citizens using Xbox and Skype actually play in a virtual bowling league. And they play against people from all over the country, but in this case today they were playing Queens versus Manhattan. I was over at the Queens shoot and uh, took care of some of the stuff. And I interviewed some of these really nice folks. And it was, a very, it was a very diverse neighborhood there in Queens. And what was funny is all these people kind of stuck to their own group of folks. And a lot of them didn't speak English as well. But there was a woman I interviewed, or a man I interviewed, I should say, who said, you know, it's really funny. No one ever talked to each other before we started doing this. You know, the, the, the Chinese folks would kind of be over there, and they, wouldn't, they didn't speak English, so we didn't talk to them. So, but when we played games together, we discovered we could. Well, that's the humanizing story. That's the thing I can sell. That's the thing I can move and get done. Not the, isn't it cool that we have telephone lines to play Skype between senior centers? We get phone lines. We've had them a while. So this is the opportunity we made sure not to miss it. And those are the stories I have the most fun telling, including that of Tyler as well, who's a heck of a guy and just wants a solid chance at a job. That's why he came to us and said, I'd be happy to do the piece. I want people to understand that I can contribute and be part of society pretty easily. And then the third angle was really remote production. We do a global business. You know, we had to be where the customers were. We could not be Redmond-centric. And this was something that took a while to sort of convince people of. A smart man once told me, you don't have to be a diverse company. You just have to be as diverse as the people you want to sell to. So in cases like this, we make it a point to include a lot of these international voices, especially when you consider how people talk about security issues and privacy issues around the world. Americans don't think the same way as Europeans, nor Japanese, nor Australians. So three weeks ago, I was in Sydney helping kind of tell that story and get that done. And while it may sound like it's jet setting and it's absurdly expensive, and yes, a plane ticket to Sydney isn't cheap, and nor is it a short flight, um, what we do discover is that we went, I went down to Sydney and shot for two days. My stakeholder, if you go to our YouTube channel and if you go to YouTube, search Trustworthy Computing, Tim Raines, this gentleman, I knew 10 days out, I found out 10 days out I was going to Australia. Oh, by the way, the other hard part, um, we also want shoots in Finland and Norway at the same exact time. So I sent my camera guy who works part-time for me hourly to those two locations. And we planned it. We drilled it down and we said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We get interviews, we get what we need, and we get out. And we were there for two and a half days in both locations. I was in the southern one, my friend David was in the northern. We flew back over the weekend. On Monday we made the edits, on Tuesday night it was out. Tim, by the way, was the gentleman that hosted it. He's one of our foremost experts in the company on security, heck of a guy. And I told him, Tim, all I need is a half hour from you at some point during the week. Come meet us by the opera house, here's your lines. And yes, I hold them up on a clipboard over the lines and he goes and he nails it. But it's telling that story to your customers. It's important to our customers to know that we're there. So yeah, jet setting might not be for everybody, but the fundamentals of planning it right and executing it right is really the key takeaway there. Um, beyond being from Seattle and living in Seattle now, I'm a Seahawks season ticket holder. I'm sorry, world champion Seahawks season ticket holder. And our quarterback, Russell Wilson, I would have hated covering him as, when I was a sports journalist because he loves to speak in cliches, but I will stick to this one forever. He loves to say the separations in the preparation. And that's exactly how we run our video operation. So when I look at integrating video and the experience we sort of went through and the naysayers and the people who said we shouldn't do it this way and this is just something we can outsource forever, I just reflect on it and I, I was like, no. 
this is going somewhere. We need to be part of this conversation. Even before I knew about the statistics about 2017, I'm like, we have to be there. And so when I think about you guys, and I think about other people I talk to in the business, and I love talking about this, but when I think about what happens in this room and at this conference, I want to implore you, nobody knows your content like you do. You're the ones who soak it up and sync it up every single day. And you know where the pressure points are in your business. You know what the VP likes. You know what the president likes. You know what the CEO likes. So that being said, trust yourself. Trust yourself to tell that story. And when you look around, you'll find and be surprised by the fact that you can turn things around pretty darn fast. But you might say, hey, you know what? I am not a creative. I heard that a lot in the capstone session yesterday. I heard I'm not a creative. And you may not have you know, every resource available to you as a creative, but you have every opportunity. I came here not because I wanted to fulfill a dream from 20 years ago. I came here because the IMC program offered a holistic view of all the switches we can pull as marketers. And in those switches, I see classes about digital production, digital storytelling and video production. And I'm sure there are more on the way or, well, I don't want to speak out of turn for Shelly if she's here. But there are more coming, I'm sure, as our business continues to evolve. So you may not have every resource, but you have every opportunity. And beyond just WVU, even if you, you know, you're done with the program and you don't feel like going back and taking more classes, there were 54,000 journalists a couple years ago, as Lee showed us this morning. There are now 27,000. I'm sure a lot of them had video experience. I know I did. So when I look at it from that end, I'm sure a lot of you know people who used to work in the media, who used to work as reporters. Many of you are those people. And I implore you to, to, to leverage those skills. Those are skill sets that are just sitting around waiting to be picked up and used. And you may not be able to staff out one full headcount for doing this. You may not be able to do a lot of this stuff. My job was half and half at one point. I took our business intelligence assignment for about a year as a half and half job, you know, because we couldn't quite make it work in the budget. And there's no shame in that. It's just how it goes. You can't scale for everything. But we made it work. And I think a lot of other companies can make it work as well. And so by being integrated and having someone in your meetings and helping you be successful, and knowing the personalities, you could produce video better, faster, and cheaper than you ever would possibly expect. That Tyler piece cost me $1,000. It got 20,000 people to probably feel a little better about our company. It's a good day. So I am really thank you for being here. And integrated video, I think, is a, is a great model. I'm a huge advocate for it. And I think it's something that should be used to, in, you know, integrate video and you can innovate your IMC efforts. So with that being said, this is where you can harass me on Twitter and all those lovely places. Um, you can also, uh, by the way, I did tweet where the slide deck was on the slide share thing. So I think it was right at the start of the meeting. So if one of my pals in the cheering section could retweet it, that'd be awesome. <laughs> and that's what I got. So thank you very much. I'll be happy to take a few questions. Yes, sir. Um, I, you know, Microsoft, obviously, a huge company. How mm -hmm. do you guys um, coordinate uh, like creative teams and you know, make sure that your videos can have the same feel as your Super Bowl commercials as you know, they can have the same feel as mm -hmm. everyday commercials? How is that? I imagine that's very difficult to do. How do you guys yeah. go about doing that? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's the expression you know, of, you know, that's a little overused, but it's herding cats. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people. You saw. You know, and, and that's the point I was you know, kind of thinking about when I was creating that slide where everything was just going out like a spider web of all this content, right? And you know, we thankfully have some really good people in what we call our central marketing group who have come together and they make it a point to constantly remind us through internal comms. And you know, they have an internal comms newsletter, they have a comms newsletter that goes out to everybody who touches marketing at the company and says, this is exactly what things are, this is exactly what things should be, you know, this is the right logo to use and you should only have this much spacing around the logo, you can't, I couldn't put the WV logo like any closer, like there are specific detailed drawdown things and they apply to everything from PowerPoint decks to creative like, um, you know, flyers, handbills, um, collateral you give out at conferences, it covers the gamut. And, as you can imagine, it's rather complicated. So there's a, quite a few folks working on that to make sure we stay in alignment. Yep. Have you ever looked at uh, scaling it up even further by giving the ability for other people out in the field to do what you do? Maybe they're regionally in the US? 
Sure. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's going to get to a point, I believe, if I'm, you know, if I'm here a year from now, probably not giving the same talk because I didn't want to bore you guys twice. But if I'm here a year from now, I would imagine we will have to scale up to let people take things for just, you know, um, you know, I, I've maintained that we need to hire, have a network of people I know around the country that I can just hire and bring on. We run into issues sometimes where someone will go to Washington, D.C., come out from Seattle, they'll go to D.C., and they'll be like, oh, hey, um, Joe, I thought it was too expensive to bring you along, so I just, like, found a local guy and he did it. And the local guy, you know, might not have known what he was really shooting, and behind some VIP there's their purse and a Diet Coke can, and then someone will come back to me and say, oh, here, make this. And I'll be like, yeah, this is what we got to worry about. So yeah, I do suggest that when you get to a certain level, you do have to start scaling because I can't go everywhere. I mean, sooner or later, I'm going to get tired of airplanes. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. How does Microsoft go about identifying those people? Because I found mm -hmm. in my experience that's one of the hardest things, yeah. finding the people with the good stories. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, for, you know, Steve Gleason, the Super Bowl ad, I mean, people, have known, people who follow the NFL have known about Steve Gleason for many years, and there's an enormous statue of him outside the Superdome in New Orleans. And yeah, it's easy to know about Steve Gleason, but how do you know about Tyler? Um, in general, we have people who work with the communities, and this is how we found the New York story is we, we, we have people who are not quite marketers, but they're policy people, and they're out in the field and they're trying to figure out if we're doing the right thing by people in the disability community or for children in online safety. And so they interact with family groups and things like that, and they go to conferences and they get to know people. And sooner or later in this development of knowing that business, you get to know those people and they'll be like, hey, there's a guy, and he's actually just down the road, and he's quadriplegic and this and that. I think Tyler's case was, a bit of luck and good fortune in the well, good fortune for us, in that he, the policy guy, in that group for Skype, actually goes to the same church as Tyler, and they just got to talking, and he was like, "Can I help you guys with anything in setting up, in setting up stuff for you?" So, yeah, it's just it's just having your ear to the ground to a great extent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. video. If you're starting at absolute zero, absolute zero, I will not give you a dollar no matter how nicely you ask. Um, there is phones. We've got our iPads. There are iPads. There, 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 are, there are products made by other companies. Yeah. There <laughs> are <laughs> there are devices. There, there are so many things on your cameras these days. They may not capture the best audio quality, though. That's kind of a drawback. If you're, you know, your, your typical you know, digital camera you may have at your own house um, has you know, good audio inputs and things like that. Um, secondly, you would be surprised at how easy it is to sort of learn to edit. Windows Live Movie Maker was actually, Windows Movie Maker, which is free, or at least it's available as a download for free, if you bing it, it is available, and you can find that. <laughs> Thank you. I know it's, I know it's late. <laughs> but you can find it, and it is completely free, and I did all of Brad Smith's videos on Windows Movie Maker because I couldn't afford that. Um, now, when they wanted the intricate stuff done, I said it's sort of like doing, you know, it's sort of like doing heart surgery with a chainsaw. But you know, as long as you're really good with the saw, you can make it work. Um, yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And there's there's stuff that comes in automatically installed on 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 Apple products. I think iMovies is is, is it free. I don't have those, so I don't know. <laughs> but but it, but beyond that, and if you want to up your game though and learn more things, um, the we use Adobe Premiere which is, you know, we, we buy the same thing that anybody could, and it's nothing special, no bells or whistles. Um, but Adobe has moved so many things to the cloud and do it, does it on a subscription basis now, and that's something to think about. If you can't do it on a, I don't want to spend a thousand bucks on one piece of software right this minute, but you can talk your management into 25 bucks for a seat for a month, 25 bucks a month, or 50 bucks a month, something kind of negligible when you look at the big, big, fat budget, you know, it's doable. Um, I suggest, though, in learning it, because sometimes it's not the easiest thing to pick up, <laughs> and this is something, you know, people ask how I learned Photoshop, and that's a long story, but what I will tell you, do it on stuff with your family and friends. 
shoot video of your family and friends on a weekend. Go to your kid's birthday party. Go shoot something. Go shoot a picnic you guys had outside in the nice weather while I was prepping this talk. And do it, and then come back and try and cut it. And see if you like it. Because if you don't like it, you're not publishing it. I mean, maybe you'll show your friends on Facebook, but that's fine. If it's not 100% perfect. But you, I was amazed at how much I learned just doing that. Just playing around. Yes? Um, when you approach some of your subject matter experts with a camera, do you yes. ever get resistance or the, you know, I don't want to be on camera, and how do you deal with any kind of resistance? Because I found that as a corporate communications person, I'll sometimes, you know, have even just a photo camera and people won't want their image on the website or it's just in whatever. So do you meet resistance and how do you work with people who don't want to be on camera? I'm really glad you brought that up. I meet absurd amounts of resistance. <laughs> Um, I, there's, there's a lot of different ways. You get to know a lot of different folks, and you, you find that there are people who are good at the teleprompter read. And sometimes you get to know this by personality after you, get, after you do this for some time. There are people who do teleprompter reads really well, but there are people who turn into deer in the headlights if you do that. And so what I like to do with some folks who are maybe a little more resistant, maybe a little stiffer, who think they can do it, but then it doesn't quite work out, is I actually talk to him interview style, the, like I did with Tyler here, where it's like, hey, it's just you and me here. Let's forget the camera and all this wacky stuff. I mean, it's, I, I feel, I, I really am more empathetic to my dentist now than I ever was before, because you're really trying to chill people out so that they can be comfortable and you can do what you have to do to make them look good and to, of course, you know, take care of the issues. So um, that's one thing. If it's, if it's bad enough, if they're really, they don't want to do it, then, you do one of two things. You have an honest conversation. Go, okay, can you tell me exactly what the issue is? You know, is there any particular thing you don't want to, is there any particular reason you don't want to do this? And then failing that, you say, is there someone else who you think can speak to this in the company? And if they, because if they really don't want to do it, they're not going to be that great on camera, no matter what format you use, whether it's the sit down interview style or the talking head straight at the camera style. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I've come to find out. <laughs> Yes, right there. So, I noticed that you do a lot of real life shooting. Mm -hmm. Do you ever do any type of animation or do you use any type sure. of programs that do graphic work for that? Yeah, and I, I'm, I do. And what does come up for us is demos. In software, that's what we do. And so I sort of minimize that for the sake of this conversation because I wasn't sure how much technical stuff was going to really fly for this audience. But real briefly, I'll tell you that we have capture software so we can see what's going on in you know, a computer screen and capture it as you know, 30 frame per second video. And then it's like, oh, here's where you find the security feature in Windows that does this. And on Windows 8, it's here. And on Windows 7, it's there. And then we capture it and set it to music. We'll do little zoom ins and pullbacks. Those are the sort of animation things I do. If I get asked to do straight animation, I generally will pitch it to someone else. <laughs> I'll, I'll go, OK, well, we need some time to put that together just because of the nature of animation in and of itself. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. What type of lighting system would you suggest for starting a project like that? For, for just, setting just like in our studio? Right. Um, you know, this is why I'm glad I have an awesome technical person. <laughs> <laughs> what I would say is that, you know, they, they, I, would, if, I would say a little buyer beware if you're just going out to a camera shop. And because of what they try to sell you, even if you, you tell them it's video, they try and sell you photo stuff. The big, so those are the kind of, the, the photography ones are the things with the big umbrellas. You don't necessarily want those. Those are, those are gonna reflect against windows or they're gonna blind your target too much and you'll, you know, it's not gonna quite work out as well. Those, what we have in our studio, uh, which of course that's not up, but what we have in our studio, those are fluorescent. So our thousand square foot little box does not overheat at all. Um, and I would say the, best advice I would give you, and these guys are the suppliers to pretty much everybody. There's a company called B&H Photo Video. They're out of New York City. Uh, if you're ever by Madison Square Garden, you can go pay them a visit yourself on 34th Street. Um, but they pretty much supply to everybody, and they also have a very decent used and returned program where you can get stuff at a pretty reasonable cost. Um, they do bulk corporate rates, they do government rates, they do um, you know, all kinds of student rates, I think, to an extent as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We've we, they they love me because I just ordered three new cameras. Which, by the way, the same camera that's shooting me right now. So, hi Panasonic P2. I see you back there. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think there was a question in the back.
Great. Um, I think when you look at publishing, you, do you have any like web folks you work with? Any yeah. content curators? And we have one at, we're regional okay, so I would lean heavily on those guys as kind of subject matter experts. How can I best kind of set this up and optimize it? YouTube is pretty good out of the box of just like you can organize your playlists and put things here and put things there. I mean, that's what I did with, with ours and I found a certain degree of success at doing it. Um, I find you know, having a trailer on a YouTube channel is really key, and having, um, you know, and ours is like a 30 second piece just explaining who we are and what we believe. And then down the line, there are, um, you know, there are the very, there's a featured this week, the things we really want people to know about. Um, I think the Tyler piece and the Australia piece are the ones up there now. And then uh, after that, it's the subject matters, you know, security, privacy, you know, so people can delve into what they want to delve into from there. And those are just general playlists, and we keep them. Newest is always on top. Anyone else? Yes. Hey, Susan. Hey, Susan. So I have a question. Yes. Um, in government, we do a lot of training campaigns around the same time as inside the government. Yep. Is it smart to take a chance um, when you said you have an opportunity to do video for a video, you know, with like your best video of the week? Is it smart to take the campaigns you already have and try to apply video? I think there's a couple different ways to kind of skin the cat on that one. I think that, you know, the Update Tuesday piece I was pointing to, Dustin talking about the security bulletins, that's a new video every month, but the script is really, really baked. We know where we're going. It's simple plug and play in some spots, and we have to plug in new graphics and things like that. So that's one avenue you could take. Um, I think a second thing, and it may sound like utter sacrilege after hearing me ramble for this long, but a second way to look, at, a second thing is maybe not every single thing needs a video, but think about things where you want to continue the conversation or accentuate the conversation about what's going on and that you want to send people to. So it's not video for checking the box sake, like, hey, it's the cool thing to do now. But like, if you think you can tell a compelling story about a certain event going on here in Morgantown based on this, you know, when I think of a year to year thing like you're talking about, if it's a festival or a, you know, some sort of event, what comes to my mind is something like, if you have the, the B-roll from last year, you know, people saying, oh, this is the best thing ever, I love coming down to blah, well, shoot it now, but run it a year from now. Build that excitement and, and build that out there, because when you're sitting there planning that next cycle a year from now, you're kicking yourself. You're like, wouldn't it be nice if we just had a couple of folks from around town talking about it that way? So that's kind of one way I, I would suggest playing it. Yes? Vine does not play into my teases um, because there is no Vine app for Windows Phone. You have to broadcast directly from the app. However, I do think highly of Vine as, a, as something I think people should use. Uh, bear in mind, six seconds isn't long. And when you have clients who are demanding 11 minutes, getting them to six seconds <laughs> is like getting them to Neptune. So, um, but you know, one thing I did want to use Vine for is we'll go to a conference and say it's like integrate. And if I wanted to run a Vine where, I, where it's like, hey, Saturday at 2.45, we're talking video, see us then. That's five seconds. You could do that. That's easy. And you do it off your phone because it won't let you do it from any other device and then edit a little piece. So that's one way to certainly play it. That's something I would love to try until they get a Windows Phone app. Yes? Um, what stress do you do before a shoot? You know, everything from script to storyboarding to sending interview questions in advance or not. Sure. Can I do a true confession here? I've never done a storyboard in my life. <laughs> yeah, people just sort of, people just sort of go, I, I don't find them to be a waste of time, but what I do find in a rapid creation thing like we're in, in this environment, is I do find it to be, I, I, what I like to do is I like to sit and ask the client, what is your vision here? What do you really think this should look like? 
And usually, the answer to that question is, okay, I saw this thing on YouTube that some other company did. And then you watch that and go, all right, we can kind of do that. Or you go, okay, we could do that, but we could do it 100 times better. And I have a few ideas. And then the conversation starts from there. Because most of the time I find my clients and stakeholders have that idea in their head. And, I, and even if it's not coming from them, it's coming from me. Uh, that shot we had in Sydney, I'm actually, like I said, a giant sports nerd. And that was the shot from the opening of the 2000 Olympics for NBC. And I'm like, where is that? I need to walk around Sydney and find where that is because that's a beautiful picture. Um, and, and then you just take that sort of thought process and apply it to general storytelling. Um, so to, to more clearly answer your question, um, time to produce a project that, like say, brand new, out of the box. Um, I would say if you're moving at a good speed about, I, I tell my clients I'd like 30 days from I have an idea to it's published. Now that's not to say I can't do it in 15. We did Sydney and Helsinki and Oslo and Melbourne in 15 days, including travel. I think in, no, I'm sorry, 10. So it's, it's, it's kind of relative, depending on what kind of process you have in place. But to be safe, 30, 30 to 45. Anybody else? OK, I will throw out one more true confession. This was the very first time I ever talked at a conference. So thank you for being here today. So you guys mean a lot to me. Thank you very much for, for putting up with the rambling. And I will see you all tonight. It's been a lot of fun.